<laughs> and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, what I like to be able to do is do an introduction that gives some formalness to this. So I do a, I do a slideshow and I do it from the beginning. And then I can say we are really, really fortunate to have with us today um, Dr. Margaret Barton-Burke. Uh, and I always go over Barton, Barton, Burke. Bart, Burke. Okay. So, but, but what's really, Margaret. <laughs> this is great. Um, when we um, met each, saw each other at a meeting, it was sort of like a small world of people that we knew. And I shamelessly invited her uh, to come to see Malloy. So she hasn't had a chance to see much. She doesn't, she hasn't had a chance to know too much about us. I'm sure she's going to want to know who you guys are. A little bit, but I asked her if she would talk about her cancer research career and the other stuff in her life that I found out when she sent me these incredible things. Uh, so I'm going to turn that over to her, get her set up, and turn that over to her so that she can. Uh, do you need a first slide to talk about you? You can put yeah, it up there I'm because actually, what it what it is is it's from sort of the journeys that I have made. Um, and you guys can read it. Uh, so how I introduce myself is as an old oncology nurse, an old, an old one, but you're not allowed, you are not, nobody in the room is allowed to introduce me that way, only me. I've <laughs> um, been in oncology for a long time. This is actually a slide that, uh, and I try to, I pared down my slides such that we can have conversation, because that's really more how I that's present right. than formal um, presentation. Plus, I actually thought, it, depending on who the audience was, um, it would be more interesting to find out a little bit, like you said, uh, Ronnie, about... And this can be movie. pure conversation. In the old days, we only had one microphone. In this room, everyone, you can have complete conversation, and, and it picks it up. It's amazing that it works. That so, part works in this room. Okay, well, that's great. Anyway, when... Um, so I have been blessed, fortunate, whatever, uh, to do presentations um, all around the world. I have colleagues all around the world. And this is something that before any presentation, even before you're um, uh, formally, you know, you're introduced as who you are as a speaker. But in Australia, this is exactly what everybody says. And it's a tradition. Um, every single speaker, uh, traditional folks as well as guests, uh, are to acknowledge the owners of the land. Well, that's really relevant to the new building because this is pretty special to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. You could tell me that. Pretty special. Okay. So just hit the space bar and that should work. Oh, nope. neither one. Neither one works. That's because the little cursor has to be in the middle of it. Try now. Okay. Okay. And so then. Um, I've done, again, lots of presentations from around the, around the world and always pick up another way of saying hello, go, good morning, good afternoon, whatever. Uh, and I'll start with a um, very nicely titled Building a Career in Oncology Nursing and Oncology Nursing Research. It's interesting, and like I said, I'm an old oncology nurse, but I will also start out by saying that none of this, like my life was was on my bucket list, okay? Um, I was, uh, a long time ago, went to nursing school, and I got a BSN right out of the block in a, law, in a time when people did not get uh, BSNs. They were still going to three-year schools. Um, and the reason I did that was because I was going to get married. I was going to have family. I didn't have a, a guy at the time, but I was going to get married, have a family. And um, when I needed to go back to work, I would need a BSN. That was really my thinking about the whole thing. I will also say, and I said, um, in terms of a plant, uh, part of the thing, when you look at me, if I've been blessed in, in my professional career. Um, it's been a long, as we were joking on email this morning, long, a long career. However, uh, my parents didn't go to college. Um, so I am not white privilege. Uh, and I say that very honestly. I did not know uh, a path to get a doctorate. Uh, I had no, not even a mentor, but I had no 
picture of what that could look like. And so when asked to do something like build a, talk about building an oncology nursing career, especially a research career, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I say that in all honesty, partly because, and, in, and humility, because it just sort of unfolded in front of me. And I took advantage of all the unfolding. And I think that that's the most important thing that I can say. Um, I went to a four-year school that I believe, so I'm from New Jersey originally, went to William Patterson College when it was William Patterson College. And right before I entered, it was Patterson State College. So it was a teacher's college. They actually brought faculty, I believe, from Columbia over there. And the Those interesting the thing, huh? Those were the days. Those were the days. That's who my faculty was. So it was very, it was a very smart, but did I know that? It was a program that was only three years old. Um, when I entered, it was probably even younger than that because it wasn't an accredited program. Again, did I know anything about having a, going to a nursing program that's accredited? I knew nothing about this, and, and neither did my parents, so we didn't know. It just looked like a good school. <laughs> um, and I had to live at home, and I had to drive to school every day. That was what was the expectation from my family, and I did. But I got a great education. A great undergrad education, and I'll tell you some of the things that I do remember. I remember a very in interesting questioning attitude of the faculty making us think. I remember wearing a white uniform from day one, not a nursing student nurse uniform, whether that was blue and white at the time, and sometimes they were striped. Um, we wore white caps right from the very beginning, and you got your black band at the end. Now, the reason why do I say that? is because I never felt like a real student. I was never really challenged. I felt like a nurse right from the very beginning. And that helped empower me into my role, like my first job afterwards, when I was picking up some clinical signs that didn't make sense to me. And where I worked in my first job was a mixed medical unit, cardiac and oncology. And so, like I said, my career has been long in oncology because that was the patient population that I gravitated to. Um, I was I was very um, I really enjoyed the cancer population. But the interesting thing is that when I found cardiac sounds that didn't make sense to me, I had no problem again from my schooling um, challenging the physician. When the physician said, "Well, I don't hear that." I, I don't care what you don't hear. I heard it, and that's what I and and that's how uh, I really that's what I meant about being an empowered new grad and empowered um, uh, clinician provider, healthcare provider. But the interesting thing is that in a very short time, what I also found was that the care that I saw nurses giving, and by that I mean I set for for myself a high standard and a high bar. Um, the staff nurses. When I first went there, I said, oh, I don't like the kind of care they're giving. And probably a year or so later when I saw that I was giving the patient sitting on the toilet naked a bath, I said, I've gone to where I didn't want to go and I had to change. And that was when I started thinking about a master's degree and also whether I could change my practice by going into education. And I went to ed into education at a really young age, but also with limited clinical expertise. Um, I learned with the students that I taught. And the funny thing is that a friend of mine just retired from the University of Delaware hmm, a couple of weeks ago, probably. And you might know Von Veronica Rompuszewski. Oh, from there's two Veronicas in the yeah, room. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Ronnie and I actually taught at the same school of nursing in, in New Jersey. Uh, but the funny thing is one of the students that we had had came to the retirement, sat next to me. Did, we didn't even know each other uh, at the time. But the funnier thing is that she's now got a PhD as well. So we were like the three of us were so smiling from ear to ear. Why did I put up such a silly picture here? Is because I think from that program, that first nursing program that I was involved in, in undergraduate, I have always, was always taught to respect the past but always think about the future and vision the future. And thank you if somebody just joined. Somebody else joined. Yeah, yeah that's great. Just say hello, Olga. Say hello. Hello, Olga. Hi, Olga. Um, so what I'd like to just do is, and we're going to go through some slides. They're not formal, formal slides on purpose. Um, but 
some of these slides are just for you to understand where I'm coming from, from a nursing perspective. So, I, and I love Wordle, so you'll see a lot of them. There's about four of them in this presentation. Um, but what is a nurse? We're all of this. Uh, and again, remember, respecting past visioning the future. We learned about Florence Nightingale. We had nursing history courses. Um, but we now, I think, in this day and age, appreciate her work more than we ever have in the, in the past. And I also used to use these slides in presentations for ONS because ONS's logo is the coxcomb that um, uh, Florence Nightingale actually established as her way of representing her data as one of the first nurse biostatisticians or statisticians. Um, again, another picture of what we are and who we are as nurses. So the first one was about pretty much about nursing. But now this one, this Wordle, really takes you beyond just that patient and that caring and the compassion that we think of as nursing, the art and the science of nursing. But in fact, what we have is um, a bigger, we're part of community, we're part of policy making, we're part of a larger group, we have cultural influences that are speaking to us all the time. So again, these are sort of my perspectives of where I come from in nursing. And I think that that as doctoral students, and I presume that that's who you are, um, uh, well, well, I, no, I don't, no, no, other than the two that are online. The two online are, and these are colleagues, so. Oh, um, wonderful, um, wonderful, so, wonderful. So, and that's a, to so that's who, the two that are online are. Okay, great. So if we go back then, let me see if I can do this. As we think about um, what, what we all bring to this group, we actually, when we, we, we bring it, we bring, what I'm trying to really say is we bring all of our stuff to who we are, not just as in career building, but as scientists, as um, clinicians, as providers, as policymakers. So I wanted you to know a little bit about me. There was a, there's an old slide that I couldn't find for this presentation, where I, and I used to use it when I was teaching my doctoral students, where it actually said, I probably um, do the work that I do because of, and I list, you know, the, I, I grew up in the Vietnam War, blah, 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 a women's movement, um, and I bring all of that to the work that I do. Uh, I've toned it down a little bit <laughs> over time. <laughs> however, yeah. Um, however, I know that that's what created me. And, and so the context is very important. Um, those wordles are supposed to represent the context and, or, and some of who I am. Now, my dissertation, to move me along, um, actually, and, I, and to, I'll also tell you some stories. My dissertation was really about cancer survivorship. However, at the time, there was not a word coined for cancer survivorship. So what, in fact, my question was, was after, after we get people through all this treatment and they survive, you know, they're, they finish treatment and they have to go back to life as they know it, what was it like? What has the experience been like? But not the experience of going through the treatment, but the the actual reflection, reflecting upon the previous treatment. And I could not find a word, because experience in the, in the dictionaries that we have, US dictionaries, English dictionaries, really talk about what's happening right here and now. And literally, I was sitting with my daughter who had spent a year in Germany, and she was fluent in German, and I said, I'm really trying to figure this out. And I told her what I was trying to study and try to come up with the right words. And that you know, if you've you know been been authors um, and writers and thinkers, you struggle sometimes for the right word. And in fact, she said, "Oh, that's in German. We've got a word for that." And she actually, I cannot speak German. I am not going to try to speak German. But what she really helped me understand was the the notion of D if wrong. The whole notion of reflecting on it, the word is experience, but it's it's again a different a different way of saying it, and you actually have the notion of ex reflecting on what happened to you, 
And so that, this is exactly what I wanted to study in my work. It, over time in the U.S., we changed our thinking and we call it survivorship now, but at the time there was no such thing as cancer survivorship. Um, for me, I define the, it as reflections on the entire illness from the patient, the client, the actor's perspective. Um, and I did a qualitative study, I did serial focus groups, um, you know, another time we could talk about that. But it was really interesting. And when I defended my committees, this is great, Margaret, you can write a book. And I said, no, I can't, because I only have one perspective. I have a white woman's perspective, because I could not enroll other individuals into the study. Um, some of that was timing, some of that was wanting to get done, as some of us know, we want to get out. Um, so, so <laughs> my first, smiling. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, I know a lot of my cancer colleagues, my oncology nurse colleagues, had said to me, "Just do a study and get done." I said, "No, it has to be meaningful for me." Um, but it really did take a lot longer than I ever thought. <laughs> um, but my first study really was to replicate my dissertation, but with a, a group of black women. And I use the word black, again, this could be a whole other lecture if we went that way, uh, because I have a definition for black. It's not African American, it's black women, because I constructed the definition with a colleague who was African American. And we said, it's not just um, African American, it's beyond that. It's uh, women of the diaspora, African diaspora, the Caribbean, as well as descendants of American slaves. So that's that's a real truncated definition that we use for our, our work. But in fact, it really did, it brought me to the next step in my research career, still staying in oncology, um, had a fabulous, did a fabulous study with at black women, uh, both in Boston, Fort Worth, Texas, and thought that I would really do white women, black women, Hispanic women, culture, you know, Asian women, and then I'm going to write my book. Then I'll write my book. Well, what happened was I got to working with these black women, and I just parked there because I learned so much. There was so much to for them to share, and there's so much more work to be done uh, in the community. And actually, that took me on my journey to St. Louis, but that's another sidebar here. Um, I had a funded study for... This, the first uh, the first research project off of my dissertation, which was uh, just a replication of the dissertation, and then this was a larger Coleman, um, national Coleman disparities uh, grant that was funded, and we called the Black Women Breast Cancer Survivorship uh, Long-Term Quality of Life, because initially we were essentially looking at quality of life in women. Um, that was one of the principles that we, I was looking at. Um, this was one of our first logos at, that morphed over time as well, but from, from not, not from the work that I did, but from an advisory group who really gave me guidance and gave me direction and also pointed me in the way that to do this work and do it meaningfully. Um, so then that brings me to another part of my life, and this is, again, all building on a career, but it's sort of stories um, of the work that I did actually unpackaged a lot of the inequities that are identified by these women in healthcare and the healthcare system. So I have a son-in-law, lovely guy, who said, Margaret, why, that could be me, but ignore it. Um, he said, why do you do what work with black women or African American women? And you know, it doesn't make any sense. You're, this is not your culture. You know, you're not connected to them in any way. And I said, actually, it's never been about black women. It's about man's inhumanity to man. Now, my son-in-law is Jewish. And I said to him, I said, when I was in high school, I read all, so I'm Irish, okay? And Irish have been oppressed by the English, okay? That was how I grew up. I'm an Irish and Italian, but more Irish than Italian. Um, uh, so, so I learned growing up about the oppression of the Irish by the English. Uh, in high school, I was um, fascinated with man's inhumanity to man from the Holocaust perspective. So I read everything there was to read about the Holocaust. And so it, to me, it's a natural progression to, to work with the, or, and, and to read and learn more about our, our own inhumanity to, to people 
within our own country. So, but it was funny because he was like, when, when he finally confronted me and said, why would you do this kind of work? And I said, it's not about black women. It's not about that. It's about oppression. It's about injustice. It's about the haves and the have nots. And although some of us have always seen the first two cartoons, uh, when I was doing a presentation for Australia on this similar topic, what I found was the last, the, the full cartoon, which has the reality at the end, uh, for those who have, they have a lot. <laughs> and it's even hard for all of us to reach that uh, pinnacle. So then as that, so my work has brought me into you the... Fit real well. hmm? You fit here real well. <laughs> says, uh, Malloy is about social justice. I know that. And actually I was raised, I was raised probably again, when you say about contextually, where did all this thinking come from? I was raised by parents who really, I said, were not educated, but always took care of their fellow man. Um, you know, I remember going to church on Sundays where my father, if there was somebody waiting for the bus, this is no lie, move over kids, we picked up everybody going along. It was, I lived in Kearney, New Jersey, Kearney Avenue. And he would say, are you going to church? Yes, get in. And we all had to squash, you know, but that's from, from a little, little, little kid, do I remember. So again, it fits, it works. Um, and again, another wordle to, to really talk about what, when we think of social justice, when we think of distributive justice, when we think of disparities, when we, and I, I get very frustrated when we truncate this down to social determinants of health because it's bigger than a lot of this. Um, in St. Louis, where I went to actually really sort of um, bring my research uh, to fruition, to bring it to the community. Uh, there was a guy, I was an endowed professor in oncology nurse. That and a you know dollar got me a coffee somewhere, is what I saw, you know. Um, it was nice, it was a nice title, it was great to, uh, but I had more fun actually working in the community. But there was another guy who started at the same time as me and he was an endowed professor in, believe it or not, transportation. There was a very generous benefactor to our university and he um, endowed close to 30 professorships. Um, I met him before he died. His wife actually endowed my professorship, um, but he really believed that faculty should not just be sitting in the ivory tower, that they should really be out in the community. And it, it, it resonated, all this resonated with me. That's why I took a trip to the Midwest. Who would ever think that a, you know, sort of a liberal Free thinker from the East Coast would move to the Midwest and stay there for almost eight years. That's kind of surprising. But the reason I, I put this up is because I think when we um, when we narrow, and I think it's truncating our thinking about um, some of the social justice issues that we have in, in this country, but also in healthcare, and we narrow it just to social determinants that really it makes it too narrow when I think of it as, big, as a, a bigger problem. And I'll give you the example that uh, um, with this professor of transportation. He, he said, how could we work together, Margaret? And I said, we went to lunch, you know, new two, two new professors. I said, I, have, I think it's a great idea. We really should think about how we should, could work together. He said, well, what do you mean? He says, you're, I'm in, you're in healthcare and I'm in transportation. And I said, but if your transportation ain't working, my, your pe my people don't get to their healthcare. And he went, oh, I never really thought of it that way. And again, that was in seven, seven eight years ago. Now you see the grants coming out. Now you see people talking about, you know, improving transportation and or getting people to their healthcare appointments on time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, but it's really interesting because that's what I mean about now when when we say it's only social determinants of health. Thanks so much. I really appreciate. I do appreciate that. Um, so so I'm trying again to to bring you along in, just in terms of career and um, I got you a little bit through. I've done a lot in terms of oncology. I worked as a, a clinical um, faculty, and I also worked in Dana-Farber Cancer Institute a long time ago. And again, I always tell everybody, if you, look, if you took a look at my uh, 
CV, what you would see is a couple years in academia, a couple years in clinical, a couple years in academia, a couple years in clinical. And I really think that, but it was always in oncology. And I actually think that that was my way of sort of protecting myself because oncology, you can burn out very easily. Um, it's hard work, not saying any other area is not hard work, but this, you see a lot of death and dying. Um, and you have to deal with a lot of emotional um, impact of, of an illness. And so I really think that that was my way of coping, even though I didn't realize I was coping that way. Um, again, taking, taking, I did all that with my master's degree and actually was very honored um, to be able to do the kinds of things that I, I was able to do with a master's degree only. And I say that because Ronnie very nicely put on the flyer some books that we wrote. And I just um, brought her 217. We write a book every year, my colleague and I, Gail Wilkes and I. And the reason I, I bring this up is because in 1986, a long time ago, again, I was at Dana-Farber, um, I have a master's degree, my colleague Gail Wilkes has a master's degree, and oncology is a burgeoning specialty. However, there really wasn't a Not textbook. A special exactly. There was no textbook. There was lots of books on chemotherapy, but there was no textbooks on really how to administer chemotherapy, how complex, you know, what kind of lines you would use, when you would use those lines. I mean, very practical things. And um, Gail and I looked at each other and said, um, let's write a book. <laughs> um, that was in 1986. Little did we know that it would take for almost to 1991. The first book got published in 1991. It took that long for us to conceptualize, write, um, envision. But it was a great book. And we did, we did get an AJN award for it. But I think the more important thing is to realize that we had th three other co-authors. Gail and I were the leads. And we've been writing ever since together uh, through good times and bad, you know, like we've had our little um, Budding of heads, but the reality is, is that she she literally um, has to be updated all the time. We update every year. We every so every year we update it, wow. and this year is the thickest it's ever been. But the first books were called Cancer Chemotherapy Nursing Process Approach, and we really used nursing uh, diagnoses, and we it we it was very nursing focused, and I was the lead author on that. But the reason I say that is because we had three other authors in the beginning, additional to us, and one of them turned to us and said. Who are we to be writing this? And that's why I have this up there. Who are we to be writing this book? And I said, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. You know, we don't know what we're doing in terms of being novice book writers, but we took a stab at it, and we've been doing it ever since. I only find out so many years later, just a couple of years ago, when I was actually more involved with ONS, was at the ONS, the Oncology Nursing Society is the big mothership of all oncology nursing. And when we're, Gail and I are writing this book, the board at the time was saying, who are these people from Boston? We don't know them. They're not active in our society. Like they were casting aspersions on us. What is this book that they're writing? But it was only like, what, 20, 25, 30 years later that somebody finally told me that you were really rattling somebody's cage, which we didn't know that at all. So I always think about I'm just the nurse, you know, and many times we say, our students say that to us or even our, our new graduate, you know, like, a, and I'm talking about doctorally, you know, in a doctoral program, oh, I can't really make these changes. Um, and I'm not talking just a PhD, but a DMP. No, you can. You're just the nurse, but you have power. And that's the next slide is because we have learned so much um, and the, the future of nursing, there's been a couple of very strong reports, but the future of nursing reports really tell us, let's, let's grab what we can. Let's push our, our initiatives and our science and our practice forward in a way. Let's be full partners with our clinical, the rest of our clinical staff. But I mean, it's the future of nursing report. There's been a couple of oncology reports where, and I may cite them in the in um, next slide. But I really think that we have so much um, to offer, and, pe and we are being acknowledged uh, of that right now. But we need to grab it as well to make the impact. Um, again, all of this comes from the IOM report as well as the um, future of nursing report. But 
take a look on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see, you know, what we really need to be doing, you know, the whole notion of new models of care, advanced practice, education, and again, this is cancer specific because that's my area. But I put this slide up there because I've always been, my glass is half full. Okay, we're stuck here. I have no money for my, my research right now um, and trying to get initiatives going, but I still believe that. You touch the screen, it's okay. I didn't realize it, but you can use the screen to do it. Yeah, well, see, so there we go. It, so try it when you want to do it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Look oh, at that. that. Whoa, oh, power. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. Now I, now I don't have to move over here. Good. This is what we were worried about. This is what we are trying to do. I did not know that. Okay. So this is where I am. I have no money right now. I mean, I have a nice budget, but I really can't. Um, I can't do what I can, I can envision what my department um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering could be. I have no money to do that. I don't have big grants to do that, but I need them. But I'm still here. I'm like, okay, we're going to figure this out. So when a student from Malloy, PhD student was, and I love working with students, but when a PhD student was looking for a clinical placement, and I have to tell you how many hops through contacts within Memorial um, before it ever got to me. And I'm thinking one, two, three, four, possibly. And one person who, who finally was in my department said to me, I got an email from somebody and there's a student who want, who's looking for a placement and I don't really want to be you in the education. <laughs> I really don't want to be in the education business. I said, I want that person. I don't know who she is, <laughs> but I want that person. And to be honest, it's been a joy. Yeah. To have a um, Malloy student, but certainly to have Heatherings uh, working with me. We're having a blast. I uh, can't wait till she comes back. So I consider myself, you know, half full. I got a pre doc. That's how I'm looking at it, you know, and it didn't cost me a dime. Now I have another colleague who took a position at MSK as a staff nurse. She, now she's a, one of these future of nurses, BSN to PhD, and this is something we could talk about because we have a, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time. She's a BSM, PhD, and felt like she needed clinical experience. So with a PhD, she went and took a job at Memorial, and, and it didn't work out. So I have her volunteering in my office, but we're connecting with her, connecting her with a couple of opportunities for postdocs that may then, in fact, she might work with me. So I, again, have full. I now may have a postdoc. And I might have it starting in January. Okay, I'll get, I'll get further along with this. And I think the reason I, I say that is because I know what we can look like. I, I have a vision of what the department can look like. But I'll also say um, we're not there, but I'm not willing to empty the glass at all. Um, some of these slides are from when I was ONS president. So again, if I'm if you're not getting where I'm going with this, I talked about when I'm newly graduated. I talked about before I had a doctorate. I talked about when I had a doctorate. And then another sort of peak experience in my life was I was um, elected Oncology Nursing Society president. Remember I said I had a bucket list? That was never on my bucket list. Some people say, oh, that's on my bucket list. I'm thinking that was never on my bucket list. Um, ONS actually helped give me some scholarship money for my doctorate. And many years later, I had my doctorate. Um, somebody that I knew was on the nominating committee, and she wrote to me, and she said, would you be interested in being on the board of directors? And I said, no, you know, I need to, I, it's time for me to give back. I had stepped away. I was active in ONS, but I had stepped away to finish my doctorate, to get my uh, research career going. And um, she said, okay. And I thought, I've stepped away for a good chunk of, you know, however long it took to do your doctorate. And then afterwards, good, you know, 10 or more years, um, I would never get elected. And I got elected to the board, without, which was a shock. And then it's a three-year appointment. Um, and then during my third year, I looked around and said, I think I could leave this, or could leave this organization. And so I got elected. And when I say about peak points in my career, it was at that point where I got to actually talk um, to policymakers, to give presentations in venues that you normally never um, 
are invited to, um, as well as to read documents that you don't always read all the time, and to become more uh, closely aligned with nursing as a larger field than just oncology nursing. Um, so I was reading like very, very many documents, but also look at, as we think about where we're going in the future, sorry, um, we're going to have a tsunami of um, nurses leaving the workforce in, in the very near future. And what are we going to do about that? And I think that that really has um, propelled me to really, you know, so that's that person with the BSN to PhD, she was never intended to be a bedside nurse. She was intended to be a researcher and help us grow this profession. And so I'm so excited to possibly work with her because of that. Um, you want skills? You can go get a job on a weekend, you know, or something like that. We need, we need people helping to grow our young and grow the profession and the discipline. Um, and the other thing that this is from the IOM report on the future of nursing. So, yeah, and, and again, some of these slides were from some of the, the presentations I made as ONS president. But we also have, we have to really consider, be concerned about and be aware of the fact that we um, need to grow nurse leaders, not just nurses, but nurse leaders. And I actually do believe that it's time. It's, it's our time now. Like, this is a perfect opportunity in healthcare for nursing and nurses. And it's our time to be the, lead, the leaders that I know we are, but we all sometimes say, but I'm just the nurse. Um, we're the most trusted profession, except for 9-11 that year. Um, but we consistently get, but we don't, again, take that, these, this data and actually use it uh, to push it push our thinking forward, push our agendas forward. And it's interesting, Ronnie and I, maybe some of you are in the Academy of Nursing, and it was before coming here. I'm on the, I'm actually helping them with strategic planning. I offered and, Very cool. and they took me up <laughs> on it. And I looked at their <clears throat> draft strategic plan and I thought, oh my gosh, this is our policy arm of our nurse, you know, a big nursing organization. It's ANA, but it's really bigger than this. And their agenda is small. You know, their plan is small and it's like, we can do this. We need to. and I so I actually started ripping it all apart and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm the only non board member. I'm the only like a little yeah. pin, you know, yeah. I'm the only nurse, you know, I'm that yeah. but I'm gonna speak my mind because I think that this is a great opportunity and the draft plan um, is ill-conceived. Um, I'll say it nicer than that, but it, huh? You go, girl. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I offered myself, I, and we'll see if, if it works, and it, see if we can get bold. Um, so, who will lead this change? And I just copied from your very nice oh, that's flyer. Good. That's good. <laughs> um, remember I said I did, I did survivorship research when it wasn't survivorship? Uh, I remember one of my first job interviews after I got my doctorate, and one dean said to me, you're all over the map with your CV. You know, and I had a nice day of interviews, but I didn't like that kind of statement, so I said, well, I don't really think I am. Well, you have, re you have articles on fatigue and sexuality and pain management and symptom management. That makes no sense to me. You haven't picked your research trajectory and your research area. So I'm driving home thinking, I don't really like this. So I did get the job, um, but was, uh, but I had to write back as soon as I got home saying, hey, wait a second, all those areas are cancer survivorship. And those, it, those are the, and remember, these are the ones I did when I was in my math, when I had a master's degree, not a doctorate. And survivorship was not even in the realm of possibility in terms of language. And so I actually articulated all that in an email, and I did get the job. <laughs> but but who's going to lead this change? It's going to be all of us. It's going to be you, me. <laughs> yeah. And where is it going to happen? 
it's going to happen all over. I don't know exactly. I don't have that crystal ball. But as I have been able to travel worldwide, and I have, I, I really feel that's where I feel like I've been blessed, is to do work and to travel uh, around the world. It's going to take place around the world. And who, how are we going to do this? We don't know, but we got it. This is our time. You have a particular uh, connection with an African mm -hmm. um, subgroup, or uh, uh, not subgroup, but uh, consortium? So no, so it's not even nursing. Um, so in, um, and then the, just the rest of the slides are just like little quotes. So uh, we could really stop here and we could actually open this up to conversation. That'd be great. Because there are all kinds of quotes and things that just for you to think, you ponder. Um, in, I, I joined the faculty at UMass Amherst, uh, September of 205. And again, I take advantage of anything that I see. So I saw a call for a fellowship. It was called an African. And remember, my interest was African-American women. OK, black women, but African-American women. And it was African, um, five, it was called Five College African Fellowship. And they were taking five faculty from UMass, and they were taking five, or from the five college system out there, and they were taking five faculty from, or five scholars from around Africa <coughs> and marrying us, and it was out of a grant. Um, I applied. The nursing had never applied before, and I got into the fellowship program. It was only a six-month fellowship. It was lovely, but I made some contacts there. One was Patricia Anafi. She's from Ghana. Patricia is now uh, Dr. Patricia Anafi. Uh, she is teaching at SUNY Potsdam. Um, and is actually uh, teaching health. So she, her background, she got a PhD in, in public health from UMass Amherst. You can see how we work our little magic, right? Um, <clears throat> there was another guy. His name was Chima Roka, is, is Yubara. And Chima was from Nigeria. Chima had to be in his maybe late 20s or early 30s. Very, very tall. A Nigerian man, very, very chauvinistic Nigerian man. Um, I had Patricia and Chima out to our house for a visit. My husband, Chima, only talked to my husband. Now Chima is also very shy, but I didn't know that at the time. I'm just thinking, hmm, he's only talking to the man. <laughs> Patricia and I hung out together. I will tell you, Chima goes back to was looking for a position. After this fellowship, he got a Ford Foundation Fellowship. Chima is a go-getter and has a CV, an unbelievable CV. Um, he went back to Africa, and he actually found this position to build research capacity in Africa, but through a program out of Nairobi, Kenya. It was called the Afri it is still called the African Population and Health Research Center. At the time I knew nothing about this organization. It was very small. And meanwhile, over six months, Chima and I built a very nice relationship where we could joke about that chauvinistic comment, you know, and um, oh and what am I allowed to say because I'm the woman. You know, I mean we really had it we really did build a, a very nice relationship. Chima goes back after his Ford Foundation Fellowship to uh, Nairobi, has an interview, writes to me and says, they need somebody to give a reference. Would you write a reference for me? And I said, oh, what is this? The male Nigerian chauvinistic guy is asking the female white American. <laughs> will, will and, me exactly. Nice and he said, yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, of course, I'll write you a reference. He got the job. One of his first charges was to actually develop a course to build research capacity in Africa, not in Nairobi, not in Nigeria, but in Africa. Um, he has Gates Foundation money. He has Wellcome Trust Foundation money. And over time, he's gotten more and more grants. Um, he brought together the first time. So he writes to me. Now I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. He writes to me, and he says, could you come and be on the faculty? Um, and they put together the curriculum, him and another woman put together the curriculum, but they invited a, an international faculty. Um, myself from the US, one guy from England, another woman from England, from Warwick University. Uh, but this, the fellow from England was also from the DRC, the 
Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so it was really an internet, oh, and a, a woman from Australia. So it was really an international group. And over the course of the next year or two, um, they listened to myself and the woman from Australia and England and actually developed a really tight curriculum because originally it was very, you know, well, you know, if you, you're in education, it was all over the map and, and it really was not geared towards adult learners. It was really geared to, we'll teach, you will learn, you know, type of thing. And we said, no, let's change it up a little bit. And so we really helped morph the curriculum. It's a very tight curriculum. We've stayed with the sim same, pretty similar curriculum, changed a few things over time, but um, we have ideas to change it in the future. So I've been to Nairobi probably 10, 10 times or, or so, um, a very much aware of my role and my place when I go. And I say that because I just tend to be very excited about things. <laughs> and uh, I think we were four or five years into the program. They now had a number of people who had gone through. We have about 25 to 35 uh, fellows each year. What happens is in Africa, People can get through their coursework, but they can't get through their dissertation. And we all know that that's the difficult part. But they're now teaching, and they're supposed to also be writing and doing research. And their dissertations are much are, are different than ours, and, and the research expectations are different than ours. Anyway, but they had a critical mass of people who had graduated. So I go to Chima and this guy named Alex. Alex is the executive director of APHRC. And I, you know what you need to do now? You need to, um, you have a critical mass, you need to, and you could see the, their backs were going up. And I said, no, 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 this is not colonizing U.S. Margaret. Speaking to you. This is excited Margaret. You don't have to do this. I just think it's now time you could bring them together for a conference and they could be building their networks, and they could be talking to each other, and they could be sharing their research with each other, and it's a great opportunity. So they said, thank you very much, and I walked away. I go back the next year. Now, this is every May we have this meeting. Um, I go back the next year. <clears throat> Don't say anything. Hadn't heard anything. I said to them something like, so did you ever have that conference that, we sort of talked about last year, and they said, no, it's going to happen in July, and you have to come back <laughs> for July. We'll figure out what you could teach at that point. So the, the thing is, is that I have been, this is where I feel really blessed, because not only have I helped shape the curriculum, we've lost all the other international faculty. I'm the only one who's invited back now, because they've built capacity even with their faculty. So their staff now teach or they have enough contacts with expertise who now teach who are African, as, as it should be. I think I am invited only because it's out of respect. I am called Ma. Ma is the old person. <laughs> and in the beginning, I didn't know that. And I'm thinking, why are you calling me Ma? I'm not your Ma. You know? um, but I've learned a lot from a cultural perspective. But it's also an honor for me to, they say, I say, they said, will you come back? And I'll say, only if you invite me, I will come until the point I can't get on a plane. Um, it's a lot of work, it's hard work, because we actually, not only do we teach, but we spend time with the fellows, helping them rethink their research or how to do it differently. I'm very strong in theory, because I went to University of Rhode Island, um, and it's a very theoretical program, so I'm all about, let's talk about building science, or let's talk about constructing Afrocentric theories, not taking dead white guy US theories, and trying to import them to Africa, what what makes sense to you folks versus um, what we can bring. So anyway, um, my, my career has been uh, fun. I've enjoyed um, doing the different things. I still have several more years, I think, at MSK. We'll see. <laughs> um, but I, and I think I would close in saying that after my peak experience of being an ONS president, I started to look around at back to academia because I was in academia, and I had said this to my dean. She was she's great. She's um, in the academy as well, Sue Dean Barr, mm -hmm. and she encouraged me to become ONS president. And then um, when I was elected, and then halfway through, I think it was my president elect year. She said to I I had done my president elect year. I was through half of my first year as president. And she said to me, 
we were having our evaluation and I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to come back. I don't think I can just be your faculty anymore. I'm going to want something more than that. She said, I completely understand. I'll give you a reference. I mean, it was very mutual. Um, so when I was looking for jobs, what happened was I said I wanted to be back uh, closer to home. And this is home, New Jersey's home. Uh, my sister's not well. And I had a grandbaby on the way. I could have showed you her picture, but my family probably would kill me for that. Um, and I couldn't find an academic position that wanted this like sort of free spirit, creative, crazy person. Um, and I'm not sure Memorial knows how what they've gotten completely yet. <laughs> but the exciting thing was I was sitting in an airport in an airport lobby in um, January in a January like 2015, and I said, well, "Where else?" So I'm oncology, research, what else could, where else has this position? That's in the mid-Atlantic. I was looking at mid-Atlantic. And I went on to Memorial. I said, oh, Memorial, what? Let me look. And they had a director of nursing research mm -hmm. position right there. I read it, and I forwarded it to my husband. He said, this sounds like you. And I said, I know. I'm a little weird. It, like, weirded out that it does sound like me. Um, and then several months later, I took the position, and the rest is history. Um, have had the joy of working with one of your students. Ho hopefully, I could have more students. Thank you. But let's open it up for conversation and thank you. Thank see what you. else. But thank you. Just to close this okay. part of it, let's. I want to thank Margaret for for sharing. It's what I asked her to do is talk to us. Let's do this. Thank you, Margaret. Bye -bye.